Dear Internet, the world is changing. Get over yourself. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Fight me in real life? Fight me in real life. Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. My name is Michael Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. How are you? Fantastic. What a week. On this show, we are going to talk about the games we played this week. We are going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. We are going to talk about our feature game, Dice Realms, by Real Grand Games. Mark, what did you get to play this week? We played Titan. You'd been wanting to show me Titan for a while. And thanks to the whisperings of the North Wind and the promised emergence of the mystical Wendigo. The one who not must be not many named. Well, we don't have to name him because he never shows up. We actually played Titan. Titan is um, a roughly five foot diameter plastic behemoth. I'm exaggerating only slightly. I guess it's more like three feet in point of fact. It's huge. Yeah, there's nothing, there's no pictures or images that can show what this act you have to see it in person. Very much like the Matrix. No one can be told how big Titan is. You must experience it for yourself. And I will say the following. I actually found the toy factor to be a negligible but present detriment to the playing of the game because a lot of Titan is actually root connections. You need to be able to make sure that you have a network of various supply centers that are all part of your network, and a lot of the goals relate to being able to connect various other supply centers to the network, and costs for upgrading these supply centers are in turn based on connections, and some of the connections... Toy Factor very high, involve going up or down a level in this massive basin because the basin is represented on the board by three distinct levels of plastic monstrosity. But in point of fact, I routinely found it very difficult to see precisely because of the angle and of just because of how it was laid out, whether something was connected. So it made the root connection more difficult than it needed to have been. I would have been much happier if it had just been a flat board. There, I said it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. That's sad. My table is slightly higher than it should be. So I'm wondering if, the, if even if it was like two or three inches lower, then we'd be able to see over the giant edge down into the deep, deep crevices that is the moon of Titan. Walker, the average height of our gaming group is six foot five. I don't think that you can seriously claim that all that we needed was a better table or a better... No, no. it is. <laughs> it is purely for visual effect. That the lower levels are represented as physically lower, when in point of fact, it could have been on a 2D board and everything would have been fine. Now, this wasn't a huge deal, right? This wasn't a a repeated instance of, oh, I thought these two were adjacent when they're not, or I thought they weren't connected when they were. This was just a question of a couple times I thought something would cost three to upgrade and it cost two, or vice versa. Or when I was trying to path a route from A to B, it took me a little bit more mental effort than it would have otherwise taken. This is a very, very minor criticism. In the context of it blowing up the cost and storage space of the game, and indeed, you leave the Titan board assembled and then so it won't even fit back into the box. So there's just this massive millstone and it's the size of a millstone and almost the weight. It's a bit of a problem, but that's just generally the trend that our consumerist hobby is going. The visual impact is considerable. It's true. It's amazing looking and it does have game there. There are lots of games that have this high toy value, right? And then the game 90%, I think, of the time does not measure up. Absolutely. Right? Giant high value, low. This is not Fireball Island. That's true. The board is, and the components are as elaborate as Fireball Island, but it is definitely not Fireball Island. And I think the game measures up. I think there's a lot there. There's this interesting choice of every turn you're placing one of these rigs, and there's a choice on where you're going to put it because it's going to tell you how many minerals you're going to get and how many pipes you're going to lay. So you go. You know, down low, less minerals, more pipes, and it's sort of a decision on what you want to do that turn. And that decision's there. And I like how they have minerals working in two different ways. Like there's only two types of minerals on the board. All the other minerals, which there are a lot of, which I, you know, you, as you heard lately, I just like, you know, so many different resources. But all of those other resources only take place on your little mini board. So not, it's not too much back and forth, but there is a little bit of cube pushing. Oh, there's not a whole lot of cue pushing. It's exacerbated considerably by the fact that the iconography, when the different colors of the resources represented, is egregiously bad. It is the case that we had to refer to coffee and creamer, and that made more sense than the colors represented on the board, which were basically white, kind of less white, kind of more white with a bluish tint and gold, because... 
based on the way, the way the light struck things, both things looked gold, and so we ended up having coffee and creamer. I don't know why we settled on that. The gold doesn't look like coffee, and the silver doesn't look like creamer, but that made more sense to us, given how the iconography worked. Oh, I just think it was so outrageous. We might as well just come up with it. You know, outrageous. <laughs> yes. Arbitrary it, it terms was bad. were preferable to what the game supplied us with, so that was abysmal. I had a very, very bad experience during the first few rounds of the game because uh, I did not internalize the rules of Titan very, very well leading up to it. It's a root connection game. It's very much like Power Grid or a number of the Euros where it's all about getting your network from point A to point B. An interesting aspect of Titan is that on occasion you might want to degrade your network because you might want something to be part of your network during the game, but for in-game scoring you want it gone. That part I thought was very interesting. Layered on top of this root connection network, there's this idea of manipulating your drones and the interface of the drones and the rest of the game was fascinating, but it was a little bit more restrictive than I thought it needed to be because there are four rounds in the game and you have four drones. In round one, you operate drone one, and that's it. And in round two, you operate drone two. You can generate bonus actions. You can generate bonus bonus movement and bonus activations with your drone, but only the right drone. It's round three. You can take any number of actions you want with drone three, but only with drone three. It was just a little bit weird. And it was also one of the uh, visually less useful elements because it's just uncolored plastic with the number etched into it. We always had to lean over and look to see which drone was where. We couldn't remember which one was where. It was strange. Now, all of that having been said, I'm not usually fond of root connection games, but I thought Titan was did a really good job. I think you're entirely right that despite its appearances and despite how very yellow and how very plasticky it is, this is a solid Euro resource manipulation slash root connection game. The only major fault that I have against games of this ilk that I can articulate cleanly that, that apply to Titan as well as a lot of others, generally speaking, as the game goes on, your options constrict considerably. And I remember very distinctly in the last round of Titan, it was taking a long time just to figure out to eke out a marginal benefit. It was one of those things where your early round decisions are massively consequential, but you don't know what you're doing. And by the end of the game, you have so few options about what to do, and they're all going to get you more or less the same place. And I don't like that as an arc of a game, particularly of a Euro game like Titan. Now, does that mean that my second play is going to be better? Probably. And I would be perfectly willing to play again. It was very mechanically satisfying in that sense once you get a handle on things. And so I, I was all told reasonably impl- impressed, despite the fact that it is a genre of Euro that I'm not necessarily always a fan of. Yeah, I really love the drones. The shenanigans of the drones are made what made it kind of sometimes silly, but sometimes fun. Because that's the definite player interaction. Because you could, you can sort of like cut people off and or like sort of move in on their territory, but it's not really like huge interaction there because there's always another place to go or another way to get there. But drones are dropping bad cubes right into their rigs or, or they've taken time to connect to the middle and they're about to reap some benefit. And then you zip down there with your drones and dump a bunch of bad cubes in there and they have to take them in. That kind of shenanigans. Because it's equal, sort of equal to everyone, and you knew it was going to happen. It didn't seem like so much like take that and, you know, unfair. It just seemed interesting. Uh, there was a little bit of unsatisfying who's in the lead right now. Let's dump and give them the dissatisfying cube. That part I really didn't like. The part that I liked more was this question about the risk reward of connecting to somebody else's network. If you try to hone into, uh, horn into somebody else's network, number one, you make their life more difficult because you're depriving them of options. And number two, you can start activating resources that they went to the bother of placing. But by the same token, you leave yourself vulnerable because now their drones can start accessing your network as well. That part I thought was great. That interplay was marvelous. And that decision to engage in sort of co-opetition with other players because board ownership consists exclusively pretty much of pipes. That's about it. Past that, mm, doesn't matter. And so I, I didn't like the targeted player aggression. I did like the various levers, though, that the drones could could pull and push in order to manipulate the the, the economy. That was Titan, designed by Matthew Podvin and published by Holy Grail Games. So this Carnegie sort of falls into the category where you talked about the end, where the very last turn, you almost have all your discs out or you almost have all your workers are in place or there's very few things to do because you know there's only going to be one turn. So it sort of, has, sort of has that slow down at the end, which is unfortunate. But other than that, I got to play Carnegie in real life for the second time, and man, this game is really good. I really want you to try it. I tried it the once. I really want to try it again. It's uh, designed by Xavier George and published by Quinted Games, and there's sort of like an action selection board, and I tried to emphasize to the players how important this board is, looking ahead to see where your income's going, when these 
different areas are going to trigger and they quickly realize that that is one of the most important if not the most important part of the game because you have to sort of seed the board with your with your workers send them out on missions and be prepared every turn because you have no idea what action the next player is going to take because everyone gets to do it so you sort of have to be prepared to do whatever and so you have to have guys sort of set up and ready to go and then it has and I think it just shines so much better in four players because everyone has this token where they can just bypass the action that the player picks. And that sometimes can get you ready for a different action that nobody else is. And then you choose that and then no one has anything ready for that. It, it just leads to this very interesting play. Like everything about Carnegie. It plays into a lot of the things I like in Euros. You know, having this, having the plan ahead and having to be very careful about the kind of economy you're, you're making. But at the same time, having to be very flexible and reactive to what other players are doing. And I remember very distinctly from the one play I played on Board Game Arena, you have to be ready for whatever anyone else can activate. And if you have all of your agents in the same region, you can go turn after turn after turn with no income whatsoever. And you really can paint yourself into a corner. But by the same token, you can't be certain what anyone else is going to do. It occurs to me, though, that you could retheme Carnegie to sort of like a special operations uh, spy thing theme, right? Because the weird thing is, you're sending, you're spending most of the time in Carnegie sending out agents to various parts of the world, and then they come back having accomplished missions. I don't know a whole lot about Andrew Carnegie. That doesn't sound like the kind of thing that he did most of the time. Was he Was he secretly Charles I, I Xavier? Don't know. I, I feel no theme in this game whatsoever. Sure. Fair enough. I thought you were about to say, looking at the end, you, you were saying you were looking back on a on a life misspent and thinking about how your legacy, very much like Andrew Carnegie, worrying about how he was going to history was going to view him, and so you're going to donate all your wealth to some worthy endeavor. So, and, and lastly, it does have this very interesting two part economy because we we're talking about getting your income, and so when someone picks an action, it's sort of tied to a region. If you have someone on a mission there, you have to pull them back, and you get zero income, like Mark just said, if you don't have someone there. And you can have multiple guys there, so you can take back three, and that multiplies from your what your income is marked on that little territory track. And then on your own player board, you have, you know, a whole sort of extra income. So if you have multiple guys there, you can just pull one of them back, so you can trigger that those two incomes twice, and then you'll be ready to do it again. It's this very interesting, you know, sort of, you know, how many do I want to bring back? Do I want to leave some out there? Do I need that those resources now type of game? Carnegie. Walker, it was the best of solo gaming. It was the worst of solo gaming. Do you want the good news first or the bad news first? Let's have the good news. The good news is that I played Core Worlds Nemesis. This is the solo version for Core Worlds, one of our favorite deck builders by Andrew Parks. Fascinatingly, although Core Worlds and its sundry expansions were first published by Stronghold Games, Andrew Parks' outfit, namely Quixotic Games, now has the rights. They were transferred amicably, which I think is great. And they recently kickstarted Core Worlds Empires, which is the worker placement version of the game. I commented on that a few weeks ago, and I found it lacking. Core World's Nemesis is the solo version. Ad additionally, though, I will note that if you buy Core World's Nemesis, it also comes with, as, Mo as Walker mentioned briefly too, a stack of promo cards. Every promo card ever published for Core World's, and I thought it was just a couple, but there were a lot. And so... That was interesting. Anyway, I tried the solo version. Now, I've been very, very clear over the years. When playing a solo version of a game, I would like it to have two salient features above all else. Number one, I want it to be sufficiently low mental overhead so that I can focus on what I'm doing and not have to relearn a separate game and run elaborate spreadsheets a la Volko Runke or David Sertze just to figure out what the thing is going to do. And by the same token, I would like the game to feel like the actual game and not like I'm doing something completely different. I commented when playing, for example, Sniper Elite, the board game, the solo version, it just felt like a radically different experience because the AI was operating so erratically. And I can say with great satisfaction and pleasure that Core World satisfies both of my criteria amply. The, the cards are very, very clear. It works fascinatingly like a human opponent in that you have some degree of warning about what they're going to go for. Normally in Core Worlds, one of the things that we love about it is you have to set up your military forces and then you use your military forces to go conquer worlds. This gives other players a little bit of a heads up about what you're doing. It also allows you to prepare for future rounds. So if you don't like what's available now, you can just have them sit in what's called your war zone. There's this lovely interplay of planning and flexibility. And in Core Worlds Nemesis, the AI first targets a world and then with its next flip, usually will then conquer it. 
So normally that has the same effect as another player setting out a massive aerial force and you're looking over and saying, well, there's one planet that requires lots of aerial force. That's probably what they're going for. So if you have the jump on the AI, if you already have your forces set up, well, you can go conquer the world first. Or you can try to plan and accommodate that. Lovely. And when it's not conquering worlds, and indeed when it's drafting cards, it's a very, very simple priority system. You don't have to go through some sort of elaborate spreadsheet about this, that, and the other. It's really well done. It's very clever. The information is very well presented in the deck, and it's very, very simple to execute, leaving you, again, in a position where you can focus on what you're doing. You can focus on being reactive, of course. I don't mean focus on what you're doing in a multiplayer solitaire sense, but you get to play your game. You get to play core worlds, which is something we like to do. And generally speaking... The solo version should let you play the game you like to play, not a different game, all, all things being equal. Now, sometimes the different game is fascinatingly different, but in my experience, that has been the exception rather than the rule. So I think Core World's Nemesis is a very, very successful solo version to a nine-year-old game. It was an unexpected delight when it was advertised, and I was cautiously optimistic because a lot of the work of Andrew Parks I found to be disappointing, especially since Core Worlds. And another great virtue of Core Worlds Nemesis is that it works with any or none of the expansions as you wish. It's very, very simple to set up which cards you include in the deck based on what expansions you're using. We think that Galactic Orders, the first expansion to Core Worlds, is an absolute must-have for the game. It really, really elevates it in a lot of important ways. And Nemesis does a great job with it. So I, th I heartily recommend Core Worlds Nemesis if you're at all interested in playing Core World Solo, and or if you just want the, the promo cards. So I'm very pleased with Core World's Nemesis. I finally got to play Transmissions, Mark. This is designed by Adam West and published by Crosscut Games. It's this very adorable, very interesting artistic robot game where there are six robots on this sort of rondelle. And no one actually owns these robots. So you have this hand of three cards. You have your own personal deck of, I think there's about eight cards. Seven, actually, there's seven cards in it. And so you play a card, either it's a picture of the robot or a picture of a, of a space on the board. And there has to be a robot on one of those spaces. And you get to move that robot. And on your little blueprint sheet, it'll tell you those four, those four robots that are on the board. Did I say six? Four robots that are on the board. And they all move the same for everyone. There's a, there's a fast one at six, a slow one at two, and two middle ones that move three. And you get to do upgrades, but there are only upgrades for you. So when it's your turn, the upgrades on your robots, because you have a separate little slot for each robot, you get your special upgrades, either grab more cubes or move a little bit faster, or you get to go counterclockwise or all sorts of interesting things. It's sort of just sort of a cube pusher. You're going around getting cubes, you're upgrading your robots, you're buying these items that are sort of you're trying to get sets, you know, like five socks or or some uh are they yeah. really socks? Yeah, there's actual socks. Oh my or, goodness! Or toasters, or TVs, or toothbrushes. It's sort of like I'm there. It's sort of like post-apocalyptic. You know, there's sure. like these robots roaming around. This, this, you know, you don't get that that feeling. It's sort of. And then there's has this sort of like side mini game too, because one of the areas you can go to are pipes, and you sort of like make this little elaborate pipe network as well. And so on the items, and on the pipes, and on the upgrades, there are butterflies and birds and that's another scoring mechanism at the end of the game you multiply your butterflies by your birds and then the sets of items you know they're all different right some like the, i think the toasters were just points on their own socks you can get in you know groups of three and stuff like that the interesting part is that the items also go in the same spots that the upgrades go so you sort of have to decide what you want to put in your robot are you going to fill them through full of items or are you going to use upgrades very interesting little game can't wait to play it some more butterfly she saw it she wanted to play it she got to play two new games this week so we had a lot of fun trying some new stuff out well i heard there were butterflies involved so it seems, exactly. it seems great cute cute robots and butterflies she was sold on the cover and that is transmissions well walker you asked for the bad news second here's the bad news i played burn cycle again see i really like the artwork I really like the the overall concept of doing a whole bunch of heists. The special abilities are really neat. And I've seen a number of people online raving about their experiences with Burn Cycle. I'm like, okay, was I high when, when we first did it? Yeah, Am was, I missing? That's what we talked about today, too. Was our first experience, was it like too small of a mission? Should we went exactly. with a more elaborate? Exactly. Said, so I chose a higher complexity mission. I chose new robots. 
And I completed the setup, and my first reaction was, why have I bothered to do this? And then I thought, okay, okay, whatever. A lot of solo games, if you're going to play a a multiplayer-capable game solo, sometimes the setup is very arduous and onerous. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Let's just push on through. And by, like, mid-turn, mid-round one, I was like, why am I bothering? Because it's just, it's the same experience we had. Getting from point A to point B with laborious rules overhead, with rules documents that do not lead to easy lookup, and with a grid that is so coarse and so parsimonious with the number of spaces, precisely because the grid had to be the size that it was because they were using chips, that it doesn't lead to interesting movement options, and it doesn't lead to being able to hide and exploit interesting line-of-sight variations and so forth that you might get in another game, like, for example, Seal Team Flicks. Now, they're very different games, but they're both a lot about stealth. And the stealth elements in Burn Cycle are just not satisfying or pleasurable to me. And I just... Uh, so, I, I, I did I finish the game? No, I didn't finish Burn Cycle. I went to the bother of setting it up and I played through a few rounds. And I was like, why, why am I bothering? There's just not... It is the exact opposite of what you want your rules overhead to action op- options to be. There's so much overhead to everything you're doing, but at the end of the day, you don't have much to do, which is not how you should be designing games, I should think, in my opinion. Because, of course, there's no there's no truth to the matter. Maybe some people love just wrestling with rules and then not having many options. Who am I to tell them how to enjoy their lives? I have tried with Burn Cycle. I tried to meet it halfway. I, I've tried. I went back again, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to delight in the robots. No, the game fights me at every step of the way, and it is just an overburdened game. Overproduced. Overproduced as well. So that is Burn Cycle by Josh Carlson, Shannon Wedge, and Chip Theory Games. So you started a cycle and got burned out on it? Class. Pure class. No notes. Mark. On Saturday, we streamed a game called Lancaster. This is designed by Mathis Kramer and published by Queen Games. It's a little bit older game. It's a very, you know, old standard Euro. With three frowny Euro dudes on the cover. Yes. We have the big box edition, right? Which was co-designed by Wolfgang Penning. And you can tell it's the big box because they put in more frowny Euro dudes. It's... They had to add more. Well, yeah. Two more because it's a bigger box. You had more room for more frowny dudes. Absolutely. So you get thick knights in this game, Mark. T-H-I-C-C. T-H-I-C-C. They go out on the spaces. Ah, what I like about it is that all the spaces, like this is what we like about our worker placement games, Mark, when all spaces matter. All spaces matter. You're pushing people out. When you have a, a, a thicker knight, you can add some some squires. Dis- disposable to, squires. Disposable squires to sort of beef them up. You have to fight France. All sorts of things going on. We played with the expansions that led to some interesting things going on. You're getting bishops. You're putting your uh, noble over there and you're getting unbumpable spaces. You're getting stuff. Archers archers to go to France. All sorts of stuff. Seals. Not those seals. Other seals. Yeah. not. It's not a circus game. No, sadly. Although, who knows? They could make a get bigger box. We played it multiple times. I enjoy it every time we play it. We had a full complement of five. Everyone loved it. Check it out. It's on our YouTube live channel. So, so yes, we have indeed played Lancaster a couple of times. One of our commissioners has been hassling us for years, Walker. For years! I say hassling, but I say it with love. To play with the full experience with, with uh, all the expansions. Now, normally, I'm a little bit dubious about expanding worker placement games. Because typically what happens is, especially when they are worker placement games where the level of player interaction is good, they often serve to dilute the player interaction. If you've got a worker placement game and you just introduce more things for your workers to do, generally speaking, that reduces the level of competition. However, in the context of Lancaster, they somehow managed to square the circle rather well. There are additional spaces to go to, but they introduce a new specialized type of worker that can only go to those spaces. Now, normally this would make the game feel disjointed and or difficult to remember, but Lancaster is not what you would call lighter. It's definitely a medium weight game, but everything hangs together really well. There's not a whole lot of iconography to remember. Everything is is intuitive. The new players, specifically Warm Boy and Sidewinder, never had to ask for a reminder about what any icon meant at all, which I think is really uh, a, a tribute to a different approach to Euro design that you tended to see more frequently about 10 to 20 years ago. And it was really pleasurable. I liked what the expansion stuff added. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a must-include but I was very happy to have tried it. And I think in future, for anybody that is capable of a certain degree of rules overhead, I would feel no compunction about adding it in right away. 
And one of the things that you really want in a game like this is that sense of competition over worker spaces, which is great. I had to agonize over how many resources to devote to each worker placement because I didn't want to get bumped off. On top of that, there's the combating the French element, which in Lancaster is basically an area majority contest with some added stuff on top. Now, it scaled very nicely to five. I was hoping that with five, it was going to feel infinitely better than with three. Uh, but as it is, I think that that it, it's less that I was disappointed with five and the more highlighted how good it was with three, I think, because the common consensus was it is best with five. I can believe that, but not by a huge margin. I would happily play it again with three. I would happily play it again with four. I played it with two several years ago, very shortly after it was released. That was not so hot because there's voting, there's area majority, as I said, and with two players, eh, at that point, things feel a little bit too loose. Things don't feel nearly as satisfying. Lancaster's solid. It's it's absolutely a Euro worth revisiting from about 10 years ago. Yeah, I was going to say that at the end, that we had left out a whole voting system. We left out a whole upgrading your castles and having, you know, a bunch of nobles sit at your at your table. Given how much is going on, it is shockingly clean. Yeah, and and it's not just sort of a fight over the worker placement. It's all about timing. It's all about – because later on you have more workers and you just sort of put them out knowing you're going to get bumped. And that sort of like pushes you to to the end of the turn with more workers than everyone else. There's all sorts of considerations to see. There's timing in the fights at France. You sort of want to be tied but near the bottom so you're not, you know, overexerting yourself. But you're still getting the majority there. All sorts of interesting things. And also worth noting, uh, a bugbear of, of Euros of that era is often, not necessarily Defenders of Stone Age, but often is about the rush for more workers. And absolutely in Lancaster, there is a pressure to get workers, there's a pressure to get more workers. But at the end of the game, there is not a direct correlation between quality of workforce and quality of outcomes. There are absolutely ways to make sure that with fewer workers, you can still get ahead. Again, thinking back on it, I'm just shocked at the variety of things you get to do in a context of of a game of Lancaster, and yet the rules explanation and the rules overhead, very characteristic of, you know, middleweight Euros of the time, which is to say very straightforward. There's no player aid. There doesn't have to be a player aid. The only thing that's a bit confusing as a con- consequence of the expansions is what order the various boards execute after you've put all your workers, but there only one person needs to know it and just constantly go over this, then this, then this, then this. There was a few things. There's a few spaces where you have to wait till a certain phase to get that is true. The benefit, and then there's some spaces you get the benefit right away. And sometimes that got in the way, but it was that, very that seldom. true. Yeah. And usually, even if you got it wrong, even if you would just delay it until later, if you are if you err towards everything executes at the end, I don't think it's going to cause a significant difference, broadly speaking. Anyway, Lancaster's great. If you're looking for a, a slightly old older, I mean, it's, it's, it's only about 10 years old. The big box was published in 2015. But if you can get your hands on a copy of Lancaster and you like co- somewhat confrontational worker placement games, Lancaster is absolutely worth trying. So lastly for me, a few months ago, I talked about Sleeping Gods by Ryan Lock. Ryan Lockett. Ryan Lockett. This is published by Red Raven Games, so I got to show it to Mark. And Mark, I might have said that it's like a grind where you, that word did come up, where you have to, you know, you get exhausted and you lose a bunch of health. Exhausted you, was mentioned, yes. And then you have to come back and get that all back, and then you go back in, and they give you option A, which is lose three health, or option B, where you lose four health, and then you get more damage and more exhaustion and you come back in. So do you think that, that did that pan out for you a little bit, Mark? Yes. Talk to me. The extent to which Sleeping Gods does a poor job of hiding the gears behind the narrative completely made the experience unenjoyable for me. Because normally narrative games like this, when they seek to actually have game elements. So we talked about this in the context of Tainted Grail. Tainted Grail we enjoyed, but at the end of the day, the grind for resources we thought was a bit of a a detriment. But it interacted with the overall narrative in a way such that it wasn't incredibly clear that the game was whacking us upside the head and saying, okay, now it is game element time. We're Story time, no mo. We're pausing the story now. Now it is game time. Get me five cubes. If we take a step back and analyze what's going on, that's clear what's going, what's happening. But when you're actually in the moment, it works out okay. Legacy of Dragonhold does away with all that entirely. It's just pure narrative. I'm absolutely going back to Legacy of Dragonhold this week. That is a vow. That is a promise I'm making right now on air to our dozens and dozens of listeners. But in the context of the Sleeping Gods, there's no attempt even really to hide what's going on. It's a series of skill checks whereby if you succeed... You read the narrative. If you fail, somebody takes three damage and you read the narrative. 
And so it's almost like there's just this massive pool of failure. We could easily just collapse and say, okay, you get 40 failure cubes. This is a combination of your exhaustion and of your damage. Every time you fail the skill check, take five cubes out of the pile. And when your cubes are done, go back to port. That could be the game. I don't think I would, I've done substantial violence to the game just by explaining it this way. There's other stuff, sure. There's skills you can get, which are of situational use, this, that, and the other, of course. I'm oversimplifying, but it, it just really felt like attrition the game. You're constantly just, the game is just attriting you. And it's like, well, there has to be a game element here. And the game element is just going to be attrition and exhaustion standing in the way of the narrative. The narrative was okay. I didn't mind it. There was some, there was some kind of cool stuff. There were some oddities about the writing whereby in every paragraph there'd be these strange headings that you weren't sure whether you were supposed to read them aloud or it was supposed to be a cue if you're trying to catch up on what happened. La- I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the short form. Yeah. It, if you're trying to, you know, speed run. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've i seen a number of people talk about how they're kind of sort of burned out on these narrative experiences, but Sleeping Gods reinvigorated it by reinventing the genre. I do not know what they are talking about because it was in many ways – less sophisticated at gamifying its narrative than most other versions there. Not that sophistication is necessarily better, but it serves to hide the gears. Sleeping Gods was just all gears. That's all I could see. The gears were getting in the way of what was actually going on, not because it was so complicated, but because it was so transparent. There was some degree of personality to the crew. The narr- As I say, the narrative was okay, but I have zero desire to return at all. Sleeping Gods. <laughs> Finally, for me, a game called Shamans. I talked about Shamans a few weeks ago. This is the secret trader trick-taking game, where at the top of every hand, somebody's the trader and they want the the group to fail, and the rest of them are playing cooperatively to attempt to win the round. And the way the trader succeeds in doing this is by playing off-suit. So there's basically a number of times that you can play off-suit in the tricks before the, the round ends and the quote-unquote bad shamans win. I do not yet know what to make of shamans. I've now played a total of three times, twice with three and once with four. With three, it was the same group. It was with Huey and Louie. And with four, it was other people. With three, there's a number of interesting changes. There's uh, There are some cards that don't go into the deck. This is incredibly consequential because in shamans, various quote-unquote rituals trigger once all the cards of a suit have been played. And they do various effects that are usually marshaled by whoever won the trick. And so timing that can be very consequential. But when you're playing with three... Three cards are gone from the deck, so that's potentially up to three rituals that will never trigger because they're not in the particular hand. With four players, all the cards are in the deck, and so it becomes entirely about triggering the rituals cleverly. But even if the bad players are playing straight, the bad player, I should say, the single bad player is playing completely straight, the bad player can win easily. Just because if you're playing with four players, you're going to have to play off-suit a lot. Think about any trick-taking game. You're going to, like, People go void unintentionally. Even if you're trying not to go void, it's going to happen. So, as a result, the only way for the good players to win is to successfully assassinate the bad player, which is through triggering a ritual, or by very clever use of the rituals and sneaking by with the skin of their teeth. This wasn't apparent to us. It was a strange and frustrating experience because of how focused it was on triggering those rituals. Knowing that going in... I'd like to try it again, preferably with Huey and Louie. Huey and Louie are sold. The games with three players, the missing cards add, add that element of intrigue and uncertainty, and as a consequence, it becomes a little bit less about trying to trigger all the rituals, and the bad player has more reason to hide, and so it becomes a little bit more about secrecy and risk and unknown and trying to ferret out the bad person. In four player, there was never any reason to hide being the bad player. In point of fact, there's one ritual that gets triggered where you swap identities with somebody else. The only reason why the bad player had to to stay secret was because they didn't want their identity stolen by somebody else who wanted to win. (laughs) Nice. So I, I, I don't know what to make of Shamans yet. The four-player game was desperately unsatisfying for a variety of reasons, but then the three-player games have been thoroughly enjoyable. And I've had both of those experiences over the course of the past week. It's a relatively quick game. It's novel, but nonetheless leverages well, well-worn well and well-known mechanisms. So I'm absolutely going to go back. I'd like to try it with five. I'd like to try it with four again, preferably with Huey and Louie present, who again are already sold on the game. I want to see whether it works on all player counts or indeed whether it works really vigorously at any player account, but I'm kind of enjoying my investigation. The last time I was this confused by a game was Imperious, where I kept playing as like, is this completely random? Is there more strategy than I thought there was? This is a different set of uncertainty and a different set of questions, but I'm enjoying looking into them. And that's Shamans by Sardik Shabusi, published by Studio Ash. 
I the, assume it, I assume it's Ash rather than H because you know it's, it's, it's en français. That, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. And those are the games we played this week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Flick Fleet Xeno Wars is on GameFound. Flick Fleet is the ridiculously charming dexterity spaceship battle game where in order to hit a different spaceship to go pew pew, you flick a die and you have to hit the spaceship in order to do damage to it. This is the fourth crowdfunding campaign that I know of of Flick Fleet, and this is introducing two new factions entirely, two new alien factions, and now they're introducing multiplayer rules. I have zero faith that the multiplayer rules will be anything other than, well, there are two more players now, someone's going to survive, because generally speaking that's how lazy multiplayer rules work but i am very curious to see what they do with the ships ship designs because the different ship subsystems tend to be very very interesting flick fleet is a great game and i have to say i was expecting the xeno expansion to be more expensive than it is flick fleet's rather expensive if you want to get the deluxe version the deluxe version has etch etchings on all the ships so rather than just being acrylic shapes they're acrylic shapes with etched details on them and that's mm-hmm. And the thing is, once you're in the deluxe version, you're kind of stuck with the deluxe version. Mixing and matching won't look very nice. The basic version has always been relatively inexpensive. But given that they only have the one printer and it's a just literally a couple dudes in their garage, the deluxe version has been much more expensive, hand-packed and all that stuff. But the expansion is a reasonably low price. We're talking about 60 Canadian bucks. I was expecting more. So I am very pleased to announce that Flick Fleet Xeno Wars is on GameFound now. Looking forward to Village Big Box because I've never played Village yet. And it's one of these things where, you know, you fall into, you know, the Kickstarter comes out with a second edition or the Kickstarter's fulfilling. And now, you know, they come out with an expansion. You can get the all in after the fact. So this is what I'm benefiting from now. Apparently, some of the expansions are hard to get. The new Village Big Box, Big Box will come with all of them. It should be out soon. Village Big Box. In October, Puerto Rico 1897 is going to be published. This is a sort of redesigned, decolonized version of Puerto Rico. Jason Perez of Shelf Stories and a number of other individuals have been aggressively lobbying to take the unfortunate colonialist themes out of Puerto Rico, because here's the thing we've been saying for years on this podcast. I'm not going to claim any credit for this, but this is absolutely proof positive of one of our theories. If it's a Euro game that can be themed about anything, if it's going to be a historical theme, do your homework and render it properly and or don't glorify tremendously barbarous acts of colonialism. So why 1897? Well, Puerto Rico obtained independence from Spain in 1897 and was independent for all of one year before it got taken by the United States in 1898, so I guess 1897 is when you'd want to situate it. I am confident, at least now, the people at the helm of theming this game will at least have some interest in doing justice to the history of Puerto Rico and its peoples, as opposed to previous editions, which, let's be frank, quite uh, probably had closer to zero interest in doing so. So again, Euro games can be about anything. Do your homework. It's worth it. And this is an instance of progress actually being made, one hopes. Puerto Rico, 1897. Last thing for me, a furnace expansion is coming out, Mark. We like furnace. It's a nice little basic sort of worker, not worker placement, engine building, sort of get your thing going, get push your resources around. This is going to add more, more independent powers, more stuff. More stuff is always better. This is... Is it? It is. Always, more stuff, always better. What's the expansion called, Walker? Mark, the expansion is called Furnace Interbellum. Good to know. Finally, for me, I can announce with disappointment that Board Game Geek over the years is becoming less and less a thing that I want to use. I'm not going to say that I'm going to stop using it, but it used to be a great place for all kinds of editorial content. And Board Game Geek over the years has now made it clear that it is less interested in doing that and more interested in entering the commercial side of things. I can respect that. That is absolutely a legitimate decision. I, ha- I make use of many, many commercial services, but Board Game Geek isn't necessarily one of them. Board Game Geek has announced that they've signed a deal with Gamegenic, and they're now going to be pushing Gamegenic sleeves on their game night Let's Play episodes. And so we we slide further and further into infomercial territory with this announcement. And uh, it's, I, I just, honestly, I feel bad because when I got into the hobby, when I first started getting going, what Board Game Geek was pushing to the front of its page was written reviews by independent operators. 
And it's not so much written as opposed to video, but now the front page of Board Game Geek is increasingly paid promotional content. What's high on crowdfunding right now as opposed to what people are actually playing right now. And a whole bunch of advertising-led video content. And sometimes, as we well know, this is a, this is a frequent prob- problem in our little area of the, of the media ecosystem – Sometimes they're not made clear what's paid content, what's advertising, what's shilling, what's sponsored, and to what extent. Disclosure standards aren't necessarily what they need to be. The person doing reviews is also the same person doing interviews with with creators, who's also the one running the demos with creators, who's also the one running the infomercials with paid... Sm- anyway, it's it's a bit of a mess, and I don't begrudge Board Game Geek for going and getting its money... I just find it a little sad that the board game geek that ushered me to the hobby to a large extent is not there to usher other people to the hobby, and that's unfortunate. That is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to our feature game, which is Dice Realm by Real Grand Games. Dice Realms was designed by Thomas Lehman. Thomas Lehman is a longtime game designer who has some very, very influential and important designs under his belt. The most salient ones in this particular context would probably be 2007's Race for the Galaxy, 2014's Roll for the Galaxy, 2017's Jump Drive, and 2019's Res Arcana. Thomas Lehman is also a fixture in the 18xx sphere. He designed 2038 in 1995, that is to say in the year 1995, published a game called 2038, just to be perfectly clear. Some people, of course, argue that 2038 isn't really an 18xx, and that has nothing to do with the fact that there's no 18 in the title, but that's a separate issue that I will not touch, because when you start getting involved in intractable dogmatic disputes with train gamers, it tends to be a whole scene. He also, in 2005, published 1846. That is the game 1846, published in the year 2005. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Dice Realms? You like that? That was good? That was good. Ever play Dominion and say, gee, I wish I could only play two cards a turn? (laughs) Ever, Ever said, hey, this card has way too many abilities. I wish it only did one thing. Did you ever complain... These cards I keep buying keep coming back to my hand every time I shuffle. Is there a way that I'll never have to see them again? (laughs) Dominion has too much player interaction. I demand (laughs) not to have to lift my head from the table for the duration of the game. The completely random dice are okay, but what's really cool is the arbitrary random event every turn. (laughs) 50 minutes is is the sweet spot, because who has 30 minutes to play a game anyway? If you answered yes or agree with any of these statements, consult your doctor. Dice Realms might be right for you, or you might be having a stroke. (laughs) So, I mean, mic drop? Do we need to say anything else? (laughs) That was perfect, man. Like (laughs) In Dice Realms, you are rolling two dice to generate resources, gold, upgrade, victory points. Why? In order to buy more dice. Also wheat. To keep your dice fed, to make your dice better, to buy more victory points. And if the game ever runs out of one of these tokens, the game is over. Dice Realms. So I don't think the game is as bad as your criticisms presented one after the other. Your crippling, accurate con- uh, criticisms would imply. It's pleasant. It's enjoyable. I like playing Dice Realms. And I'm not gonna, I- I'm not gonna leave a table if it's put in front of my face. But I think you're absolutely right in terms of some of your, your salient critiques. Let, let, let's start with one of them. And that is, I think this is one of the most crippling, actually. Why dice? Because, again, you get a very strong Dominion vibe from playing a game of Dice Realms. There's the five special things that are, that are kind of like the equivalent of the ten special action cards that you have in Dominion. At the same token, you have a much broader selection of things that are always available in Dice Realms as opposed to Dominion. But here, they're not cards, they're dice. And you're physically altering your dice. When you upgrade a die face, you pop out the bit of plastic. This was, in, uh, this was a technology first published in Rattlebones, also by R- uh, Rio Grande Games. But that was much less of a game than Dice Realms is, and then you take the new dice face and you literally slot it in. But what are you gaining and what are you losing by, by virtue of the fact that it's dice? Well, you're gaining a toy factor. No doubt about it. The first, the, I will say the first th- two and a half times I played Dice Realms, I really enjoyed manipulating little dice faces. It was cool. Yeah, we talked about games where we just love rolling dice. Yes. And this you're actually building your dice. You're, you're, you're manipulating the way you want them to be. But what are you losing? Well, you're losing exactly what you said. We don't object to randomness necessarily, but when you buy a card in Dominion, you know you're going to be able to use it. 
there's a certainty there now. There's still tremendous... This is not really about luck, actually. This is very little to do about randomness because there's a huge amount of variance in randomness in Dominion. Massive. I think it's it's often underappreciated the extent to which games of Dominion hinge on good luck versus bad luck. I'd even be willing to accept that overall there's less... There's a lower influence in luck in Dice Realms than there is in a game of Dominion. But it feels less satisfying because you can keep buying all this stuff and it'll never come up. Ever. There's no guarantee that it'll ever come up. And we've played games like that, whereby people just keep sticking the same face on the die because they really want it to trigger, and it just never does. The other difference is that you're constantly culling your deck. So be it. You know, because you're never increasing the size. You can buy more dice, but normally you're you're removing a die face and you're adding another one. So you're culling your 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 dice every time you upgrade them. So it's a little bit different. True. That is, I think, one of those things that's neither better or worse, just interestingly different. Uh, I don't want to lean on the comparison between Dominion 2 too much. It's just I think that yes. your criticisms with respect to the ways in which it differs from Dominion are just really, really well taken. To me, this feels a lot more like other Tom Lehman designs. That's, there's a reason why I stressed his Tableau Builders. Because Tom Lehman, over the course of the past few years, ever since 2017's Jump Drive, has really been experimenting with incredibly minimalistic point races. And some of them are, I find, really, really satisfying. 2019's Res Arcana, I think, is a fabulous, fabulous game. And it really is one of those games that spirals out of control very quickly. I made a joke when we were playing Dice, Rel Dice Realms the other day. Is that the early game is maybe your first two turns. And then maybe you have another two turns of mid-game, and then it's the end game. And there you go. It's almost all end game. The end game comes much faster than you might think it, it, it comes. I'm wondering if this, this is something that washed out in playtesting. I'm wondering if... In longer games, they just found that at the point where it ends now, whoever was ahead wins anyway. So why not just end it then? Oh, sure. This Again, the duration isn't even really a criticism in and of itself, although maybe a little bit later because I'll, we'll start talking about the physicality of Dice Realms a little bit more. I, I agree with you that most of the time if you're ahead in the middle, you're going to be winning. That's probably something that would shake out. And it's also the case that, look, let's be frank, the things you're doing with your dice aren't all that interesting. So the game wouldn't benefit from being twice or three times as long. So 15 minutes is just about right because your dice are dull. This die gives me two wheat. Oh, I'm going to upgrade it. Now it gives me three wheat. Oh, this is the special die face. This is the special die face that's unique to the setup. Do you know what it does? It gives me five wheat. Oh, now we're cooking with gas yeah, but now. But now you have another die face that we're now you can convert those wheat into victory points. And there, there's a little bit of... Interesting right. combinations yeah, yeah, yeah. going on. Well, co uh, well, that's just it. Again, combos. To what extent do we actually get to build combos? When I think of combos, I like there to be some reliability that they actually get to trigger. I think of cards keying off each other in a game like Mage Knight, because everything is basically like Mage Knight. I think of things like even very, very simple games. I was actually comparing this in my head to Aquatica whereby you can build combos very simply because when you buy a card, it comes into your hand and you can play your cards in the order that you want and be able to lattice these things and trigger combos very deliberately. They're all dice. You can't be guaranteed you can combo anything ever. It's true. And a lot of their, what they call lines. So this is how, what the hell the upgrade system cost. All the different die faces come in these lines and you sort of move up the lines and make them better. And there's a, a, a few of the lines that trigger off of certain symbols on the dice. So the number of these symbols you have, you get a multiplier. And so like you said, if you need multiple faces of that die to come up in order for it to do anything. So they do have these tokens where you can set the die face to any side you want. And they do have multiple rerolls. You get a reroll every turn, and they have tokens that you reroll. So you have a little bit of leeway there. Yeah. I, I, I shouldn't you're, – you're absolutely right to emphasize that I shouldn't be harping on this that much. It's just – when I look at a game like Dice Realms, and I compare it to, again, a lot of other games by Thomas Lehman, I ask, what am I getting out of the dice, and what am I losing, Right. And I am losing the guaranteed combo elements that I can get out of a game of Res Arcana, that I'm getting, that I could get out of a game of Race for the Galaxy. And so it, the fact that it's a step backwards in terms of control, again, not even in terms of randomness necessarily, because there's also a lot of randomness of those other games. Just it feels like I have less control. And as a consequence, the combos that I can do are by necessity less complicated. And I think for me, at least less interesting in a game of Dice Realms. So let's talk about a game. Because you can either do a random setup, they give you this gigantic cloth bag, and this is because you, if you're doing a random game, you're drawing these tiles out. It's sort of like, you know, getting your random 10 cards in a deck building game. 
And it has to be a giant bag because some of the tiles are double-sided, so you couldn't just have a stack and, and shuffle them up. Although they'd only have to replace like four tiles and they'd be able to do that and then just have the other tile. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> and I really feel though the presets are the way to go because hundred percent because they have sort of combos, die faces that already combo off each other. And if you start pulling random things out, you're just going to have a mess of a time. Yes. The, the random setups I found much less, much less satisfying than the random setups, even in a game of say Dominion. And again, here, I, I think that the comparison case really is Dominion because really in terms of choices that you're making, more or less you kind of pick the route you're going to go. But unlike Dominion where you've got 10 action cards and you pick a couple and those are the ones you're going to make work, at least here there's a smaller universe and you can make a decision about what what route you wish to exploit. And again, there's not enough time to pivot to a new strategy, but that's okay because the game's going to be over anyway and so that's all right. And there is one aspect though that I really want to emphasize in which I think Dice Realms is superior to a lot of games of Dominion. The ramp up in Dominion, frequently you're like, okay, I'll buy the better currency or I'll buy this or that. In Dice Realms, your forward progress is usually immediate and considerable. Every turn, you get to feel like you're doing something. It's not the coolest thing in the world, but you're going to be upgrading at a consistent pace, and your dice consistently get better. Unlike Dominion, where you can very easily end up with a whole bunch of chaff unintentionally, or just by virtue of how the flop comes out. Since we did a quick comparison, the other comparison is that everyone's doing stuff at the same time. Yes. There's no turns. Everyone rolls the dice. Everyone does their thing. Then you go again. There's no turns. There's no downtime. It's just go, go, go. The player interaction is very similar, actually, to that of Tom Lehman's previous game, Res Arcana. In Res Arcana, it is mostly multiplayer, solitaire, resource generation, cube conversion kind of deal. But there's the possibility sometimes of attacks coming out. And they, the timing of those attacks, although in the case of Res Arcana, it's deliberate rather than arbitrary, and the resources that they will drain cause you to have to take that into consideration so it's not purely multiplayer solitaire and you're not just running your own engine. I will say, though, again, comparing it to Res Arcana, the things in Res Arcana just struck me as cooler. Because in Res Arcana, you get these nifty little magic artifacts that are different every game, and you get to think, these are my things, and oh, I get to summon this dragon thing, and now I get to buy this place of power. And as a consequence, you have a sense of ownership over neat stuff rather than the same effects in slightly different combination every game. Yeah, well, you have more time to make it your thing because it comes up a couple times in your deck and you sort of... Uh, I don't know about more time. Well, I, I I think all told, a game of Res Arcana is roughly as quick, roughly as, oh, we're done now already? Oh, the end game started two rounds ago and I thought we were still in the mid game? I think there's a lot of comparison in terms of the overall arc of Res Arcana and Dice Realms. So what do we think of this event die? Every turn, there's this red die that's rolled... And it's going to be something good, maybe sometimes, and usually something bad. Two of the faces have winter, which means you have to start paying for all the dice you have. You can buy more dice. So that means it's sort of like like we talked about, there are sort of uh, strategies you can go with, like sort of maybe hopefully upgrade your gold right off the beginning. So you maybe buy one or two extra dice. And then these winter f- effects come up and you just have to start paying for your dice. And you might run out of grain and you're going to take some negative points there's you know bad yield for your grain good yield for your grain free upgrades and then there are some uh tiles in the game that you manipulate that that die as well i mostly found the winter the one area where i will actually complain about randomness because in the basic fate die one out of three times you need to pay for all your dice and if you can't you start losing points and a lot of players tend to skirt near the edge of disaster. And the other half of the time, players tend to build up massive stockpiles of grain. And the difference between success and failure could be one or two extra rolls of winter. We've had strange games where winter comes up all the time. Strange games where winter hardly comes up ever at all. And it becomes a little bit difficult to anticipate how much you should spend time taking grain so as to protect yourself against that when it is purely arbitrary like that. Now, when other players then start having attacks that starts stealing your grain, that gets a little bit more interesting, especially in those presets where there are a lot of attack powers and a lot of defense powers. Those risks strike me as a little more calculated because at least there you're reacting to what other players are doing as opposed to just the one in three shot that Winter provides. And the attack, just to be clear, always attack all players. There's never any targeted attacks. And I think that just leads to the game to run much quicker. You're not like sort of trying to figure out who's in the lead or picking on anyone. My dice has an attack. It affects everyone. Can you defend it or not? Move on. Absolutely. Then, like I said, you can buy more dice. It takes a whole bunch of gold and a little bit of grain, but then you get 
three dice to roll and there's a victory point die or a die that is identical to the one you started with and you can start upgrading it as well. And this can often be very useful because, as I said, you're, you're going to be getting a lot of upgrades and it's entirely possible near the end of the game, especially if you used your upgrades to upgrade your upgrading capability. How many times can I say upgrade? You might run out of upgrades, and so you just need new dice so you can make them better too. Now, I find it actually really interesting that the dice cost grain to purchase because you're simultaneously paying grain to get the extra die, and you're now more vulnerable to winter effects because you need to pay for all your dice. And so I really respect that, and it felt like those risky elements, those decisions about whether or not to push for an extra die, those I felt were some of the most satisfying resource decisions I ever made in games of Dice Realms. So let's talk about actually setting up and tearing down this game. Whew. So to set it up, you're going to want to play a preset like we already talked about, which means you now have to sort through all the tiles and find the ones that you need. Then you have to make all of the current die phases available, which there could be nine of. And then you're counting out the resources. If there's less than four players, then you have to reduce all of the resources down and figure out how many you need to put out that will trigger the end of the game. Of all three types. Of all three types. And then you're ready to go. This is if the game was put away correctly, because then you might have to reset all the starting dice back to their original starting faces. And then there's the teardown where everyone needs to basically deconstruct all of their dice and then reconstruct them from scratch so you can set up for future games. Now, there's a reason why we're stressing this. Normally, we don't go into great detail about setup and teardown. Normally, the games we talk about last more than 15 minutes. And there's a proportionality here. Your first few games, you're going to spend as much time with setup and teardown as the actual game, in all likelihood. Maybe even in some cases more. And so, again, the first couple times you do this, it's fun. It's it's a fun toy to deconstruct. It. You're not, like, building something out of Lego or something. Sorry, Lego well, TM brand building blocks. I was about blocks. to say, I think we just got taken down. <laughs> but it, it's pleasant enough to play with the big plastic chunky dice and peeling off faces. And even if one or two falls onto the floor, picking them up and, and manipulating them. And the game comes with lovely trays to organize and sort everything. Thank goodness these are customized D these are customized dish trays a la counter trays for a war game, but with specialized graphics that actually serve to sometimes confuse what's going on. But that helps a great deal. But you still end up spending about as much time with setup and teardown as the actual game itself. And the dice work great. They do come off very easily. They go on very easily. We have had no problems with our dice. Scoring at the end is Except very... for cocked. I, 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 my dice end up cocked an awful lot, a, a lot of the time. Just standing up there on an angle when you play on a velveteen surface. That yeah. was impressive. <laughs> yeah, like when we say cocked, doesn't mean like against a book or the rule book or yeah, another token. Yeah, just by token. itself. Literally standing on the corner of the die twice in a row. Yes. You got that. that I, guess I, I guess I just haven't learned how to roll dice properly. I, I, I've been doing it for decades, but apparently I do it wrong. Yep, scoring quick, game length very fast, so you can get through a bunch of games. But, you know, are you going to be dissatisfied with, you know, pulling these dice apart? And and are you just going to play with the same tokens? Or are you going to put all of these tokens back in the tray and then get all the new ones for, like, a different setup? Yeah, it's not one of those things where it takes a while to set up, but you can play several games in succession without any additional setup or tarot. No, no, no. The transactional cost of setting things up is more or less the same with subsequent plays, unless you want to play the exact same setup, which mostly defeats the object. Nope, my my plays have been very enjoyable. It's just it is an enjoyable game to play. You know what I mean? Yes. We can there's lots of stuff we said negative about it, but the the time it takes is so short and just the sort of manipulating, pushing the die phases in, wondering if it's going to come up, trying to get that one little combo going that, you know, see if I can get it to pay off at the end. Yep. All of these things are interesting enough that I will play this over and over. I, I keep comparing it. And again, it, it's weird given that we enjoy playing it, that we're spending this much time on negatives. And I think one of the reasons for me why I'm doing that, the reason why I'm spending so much time is because in comparison to other Tom Lehman games that don't have these problems but have a similar type of experience, it's worth emphasizing. So again, compare, to me, the closest game to playing Dice Realms is kind of Res Arcana. It feels a little bit like Dominion exactly in terms of structural elements, but to me, it feels mostly like Res Arcana. Quick mostly multiplayer solitaire game with a fair amount of setup variety where that where the end game happens much much faster than you might imagine 
And it's the case that the re- the uh, you're trying to get a combo, maybe a combo and a half to trigger, and that's going to cause the game to spiral out and cause the uh, the resources in question to be exhausted. That's exactly what happens in Res Arcana. And the salient differences between Res Arcana and Dice Realms, one of them I already mentioned, I feel like the things happening in Res Arcana are slightly more thematically interesting than what's going on in Dice Realms. Rather than just sort of Dice Face that gives me two points of upgrade, I get to play around with weird thaumaturgical elements and summon bizarre creatures. There are, there are, there are two other salient differences between Res Arcana and Dice Realms. One of them is the setup for Res Arcana is incredibly quick and the teardown is equally quick. And number two... For a copy of Dice Realms, you can get Res Arcana both expansions and then Res Arcana and both expansions again, and probably both expansions again if you wanted to. We haven't mentioned this yet. Dice Realms is expensive. Yeah, I was about to say, I was going to say, the reason I'm saying so many negatives is because I want people <laughs> to look into it. Yeah. Because when they see the price tag, I want to make sure they know what they're getting. Absolutely. And again, especially since you can get other Tom Lehman games that are similar. That are similar. Uh, it's you know where the money went, right? As I said, they're customized dice uh, dice trays for all the little uh, uh, faces. The engineering is well done. The, the, everything is functional. This could have been a, a non-functional mess. If it were slightly more difficult to pry out the dice faces or slightly easier and they popped up by themselves, it would be completely unplayable and a disaster. Yeah, I made this comment when we were playing before. There are tons of games or a tons of designers that would want these dice in their game yes as like a little side thing or you know you slightly upgrade your attack dice but they can't because it's too expensive i agree if anything this this shows me what it could be used as an element in other games so for example if you could exert some degree of control over the fate die for example this is just spitballing right i'm not suggesting this this in particular if you had some voting element a la lancaster and you could use that to to influence what the fate die would look like in a different kind of game, say to replace the Westeros decks in Game of Thrones. That, I think, would be super interesting and also prohibitively expensive. (laughs) Or if you could have a system whereby, as you said, upgrading your combat units causes your combat dice to start working differently. That would be super neat. A lot of games do that with custom dice, but with the ability to customize your dice, you'd have so much more latitude. Think about the Civilization games where you have this military technology that gives you a plus one to combat, this other military technology that gives you plus one to combat. You can instead make it so much more personalizable and customizable with these dice, and it would be too expensive. Other army games where it's like, oh, you have air units, you have land units, you take two red, two blue, and a gray, and you get to roll those dice. Imagine if you could change faces of those particular things. Oh, man. Exactly. And so, again, the toy factor is non-negligible, but it's kind of undercut by the amount of time that, that's going on. I will happily play Dice Realms, but it's a lot of money, and it's mostly for me, it seems like a successful proof of concept rather than a full worthy game that's worth blowing about 100 bucks on. I would much rather play Res Arcana and then pocket the rest of the money on, in, on candy for what it's worth. But Tom Lehman in my experience, does not do bad games. So it's an interesting experiment, and I'm glad I experienced it. But uh, it's not a it's not a purchase I can counsel. I agree, 100%. Well, thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us on sowronggames.com slash contact. We will read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. We're available on a variety of social meds. One thing we neglected to mention on the, on the news, this is a multiple of five. It is. It is episode 220. We have a Patreon. One of the reasons why we reviewed Dice Realms, as opposed to any number of other games, is because the commissioners and overlords of our Patreon did tell us to. Yeah, we have a little poll where we put up a bunch of games that we've played recently, and you get to vote on which one we review in the main review. Similarly, I'm in the process of finalizing the list of games that's going to be sending out to commissioners and overlords. We also have bonus content coming out this week. More bloat, more pledge of indifference. More, kick, uh, more Patreon-exclusive content for people who are at the swagger level and above. We love our patrons. We and try to shower them with as much nonsense as we possibly can. There's stuff happening, Mark. There's stuff ha- Things in, are happening. In the background. Events are occurring. There's stuff happening. It's abs- ab- no one can deny Be that. Be ready. So thanks again very much for everything. Thanks again very much for spending your time with us. And we hope to see you again soon. Ready, start, next time, go now. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. 
You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>